Where's your heart? Thoracic cavity in its own little sac called the pericardium, the ulnar, all this stuff, the anatomy. If we look at the right heart, we call it the pulmonary circuit because it pumps to the lungs. We look at the left heart, we call it the systemic circuit because it pumps to the systems of the body. So let's take a look at the, the heart. Uh, recall that there are two atria and two ventricles. Blood enters the right atrium from the superior and inferior vena cavi. From there, it passes in or through a uh, valve called the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. The tricuspid back valve is anchored in the right ventricle by specialized structures called the chordae tendini, there's the word, and papillary muscles, there's the, the word. Once blood is in the right ventricle, it will be pumped out into the pulmonary trunk or pulmonary artery. At the base of the pulmonary trunk is a pulmonary semilunar valve. Three small flaps to, the, to that valve. They look like half of a moon, so that's the term semilunar. Blood goes through the pulmonary trunk, out to the pulmonary arteries, into the lungs, oxygenate the blood, return it to the heart through the pulmonary veins. The veins, pulmonary veins are going to empty into the left atrium. Blood will pass through the bicuspid valve into the left ventricle. Bicuspid valve is sometimes called the mitral valve. If you are Catholic, when you were in catechism, they told you that the funny little hat that the bishops and pope wore were called a miter. miter. Good job on your catechism. Uh, and so they called this then the mitral valve because it reminded somebody of the, right, the, the funny little so it passes through the bicuspid or mitral valve, cordy tendony, papillary muscles again. Left ventricle contracts, pushes the blood up into the aorta, not shown here, but there is an aortic semilunar valve. We go out to the systems of the body, return via the vena cavi back to the right atrium. Left ventricle, quite thick because it's pumping to the whole body, right? The systems of the body. Right ventricle, not so thick because it only has to pump to the lungs. Here's this diagram showing this, right? So, same idea. And of course, they chose to use blue to try to help you with the oxygen, that it's oxygen poor, but we know it's not blue, right? So, oxygen poor blood out to the lungs, oxygenated, returned by the pulmonary veins, left heart system, systemic system. Okay. All of that for us. So if we take a look at cardiac muscle, we talked briefly about this before. It is striated, it is uninucleate, uninucleate, it does have intercalated discs. You can see a few intercalated discs here. Those are cell-to-cell -cell junctions that allow the conduction of electrical impulses to travel from one cell to the next. Uh, the two atria work together as one kind of giant muscle, sometimes called a syncytium. The two ventricles work together kind of like one giant muscle, right? So the, the impulses can't get from the atria to the ventricles without going through a specialized conduction system that we'll get to in a minute. When we looked at action potentials in nerves and skeletal muscles, they look like this. When we look at an action potential in cardiac muscle, it looks like this. So we see the depolarization, and then we see this really long plateau before it depolarizes. On Wednesday, we'll find out why that's the case. See that, right? So we learned about, again, about the pulmonary circuit and the systemic circuits and the different uh, parts. Uh, and then we left off just talking a little bit about cardiac muscle. Uh, we talked about the general structure, that it's striated, uninucleate. Uh, and, and I said that there's a very long refractory period. So when we look at a normal action potential, we expect to see depolarization go up, and it comes back down. Clearly, this does not look like that, right? So we have this really long plateau that's here. 
It turns out that in cardiac muscle tissue, when the, the myocardial tissue depolarizes, it opens up some channels for calcium that we call the slow calcium channels. And those slow calcium channels allow calcium to leak into the inside of the cell. Well, calcium is going to leak in. It has a positive charge on it. And so it's going to keep that cardiac muscle tissue in a constant state of depolarization, right? Constantly depolarized for a long time until the calcium channels close. And so that gives us this long plateau here. Once the calcium channels close, then of course we repolarize as always with potassium going out. There's a real advantage to having this long plateau. And the advantage is that, what, remember when we talked about action potentials, we said there's a refractory period. There was an absolute and a relative, right? But there was a refractory period. Well, you look at this and hopefully it'll occur to you that there, this is gonna all be in a refractory period. It can't depolarize any time during this. Because of that long refractory period, there is no way to get tetany in cardiac muscle tissue. Remember, in skeletal muscle tissue, if we stimulated really rapidly, we could get the muscle to stay in a sustained state of contraction. You can't get that in cardiac muscle tissue, and that's really good, right? Because let's say that a tiger's chasing you, and you're running faster and faster and faster. Now your heart rate up to 200, and all of a sudden it goes into tetany. What's going to happen to you? Plus, right? You don't want a long sustained contraction when you're dealing with cardiac muscle tissue. You want faster contractions, right? Not uh, sustained. So this plateau uh, time, the, the refractory state, keeps the, the cardiac muscle from having tetany. Cardiac muscle tissue exhibits rhythmicity. So perhaps you've read some you know, history books or something or seen it in movies where the Aztecs would sacrifice some person and they would cut his chest open, pull out his heart, and lay it on the altar and it would still be beating. Now how is it that the heart could still be beating when it's not connected to any nerves? It's automatic. It is able to con contract on its own. It has its own built-in rhythm. So cardiac muscle tissue exhibits rhythmicity. And it turns out that there's a leakage of sodium into the cells in the special kind of pacemaker cells that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Sodium leaks in, and then we have another kind of channel that we call the fast calcium channels that open, and that the upsweep in the cardiac, uh, in the pacemaker uh, cells that we'll talk about, the upsweep is actually here due to the influx of calcium through these fast calcium channels. So there's a built-in rhythm. It's due to both the leakage of, of sodium and due to the, the calcium channels fast and, and slow. So let's look at this heartbeat coordination, this idea of a pacemaker. If you tease out individual cardiac muscle cells, each cell exhibits rhythmicity. So you can take a single cardiac muscle cell, put it in a saline dish, and it will continue to beat at some intrinsic beat, some intrinsic rhythm. We can't have all the muscle cells of the heart beating at their own rhythm. We want them to be coordinated. And so our heart has a built-in system to coordinate all of the cells together, right? So that, that we have this, this coordination. You learned in anatomy that the center of this, the, the place where this originates, is something called the sinoatrial node, the SA node. I, I thought you already know that. Uh, all right. So it's the sinoatrial node, the SA node, sits up there in the top of the right atrium. Impulses originate there at about 72, on average, 72 beats per minute. The impulses are going to then spread over the atria. And so this conduction system that we're describing here, folks, is uh, specialized cardiac muscle tissue that's very good at conducting impulses. It's not nerves, right? Special cardiac muscle cells. So the impulse spreads over the atria, and eventually we come to an area that we call the AV bundle. Huh? The 
the AV, excuse me, the AV node, AV bundles below. When should we come to the AV node? AV stands for atrioventricular, right? Atrioventricular, between the atria and the ventricles. So we're going to come to the AV node. Impulses will go into that AV node. There's about a tenth of a second delay that occurs there. And then impulses are going to spread into the AV bundle. The AV bundle has another name. It's sometimes called the bundle of his. So AV bundle, also called bundle of his, named after a German scientist, right? It's not a sexist term. <laughs> the impulse will spread through that AV bundle into the septum between the two ventricles. Into the septum between the two ventricles. And in that septum, it's gonna, this impulse is going to split into two different branches. The left bundle branch and the right bundle branch. So it's going to spread down the septum and then out into the myocardial cells, heading towards the myocardial cells. Before it can get to the myocardial cells, it's going to pass through some fibers that we call the Purkinje fibers. Once we go through the Purkinje fibers, the electrical impulse will hit the individual myocardial cells, and then they will depolarize and, of course, then contract. Impulses from the atria cannot get into the ventricle by any other means than through that AV node. Okay? So they, they can't just kind of circumvent that. They have to go through that AV node to get into the, the ventricles. The AV node has its own built-in rhythm of about 60 beats per minute. Okay? So it, it'll send out impulses at about 60 beats per minute. If you closed off the SA node, didn't let it conduct, the AV node will uh, send out impulses at about 60. And if we had no impulses coming from the conduction system at all, the myocardial cells will send out their own impulses at about 20 to 30 beats per minute. Okay, so if you teased out those myocardial cells, you'll find them contracting at about 20 to 30. Because the SA node is sending out the fastest impulses, about 72 beats per minute on average, it, it gets to be in control. So it's going to send faster than any of these other places. So contraction of the muscle. So the impulse spreads through this conduction system. But just like when we talk about skeletal muscle, after the electrical impulse spreads over the tissue, the next thing that happens is it contracts. So the impulse spreads over the atria, gets into that AV node, not shown here, but gets into that AV node. There's a little pause, back a tenth of a second, which gives the atria time to actually depolarize and contract, forcing the blood into the ventricles. So the atria are going to contract, force their blood into the ventricles, then the impulse quickly spreads down to the apex of the heart, right, and out through those Purkinje fibers, then the ventricles will contract, right? So we're going to get the two atria, boom, the two ventricles, boom, right? Over and over again, two atria, two ventricles, two atria, two ventricles. <laughs> the term that we use for contraction is systole. So there's that word, right? So we use the term systole for contraction. And for relaxation of the cardiac muscle tissue, we use the term diastole. So we're going to have systole of the atria while the ventricles are in diastole. And then once the atria contract and push their blood into the ventricles, the atria will go into diastole and the ventricles will contract. Right? They'll go into systole. <coughs> Sometimes this conduction system doesn't work the way that we'd like. Yes? Um, where does that um, process end? Uh, the conduction system. So the, the end of the electrical impulses is when they get into the myocardial cells. Okay. Right? Down in the ventricles. After we get through the Purkinje, mm -hmm. out into the myocardial cells, then we're done. Then the next impulse will come from the SA node again. So sometimes there are blocks in this conduction system. Uh, very rarely the SA node will, will have a block in it, so they're trying to show in this diagram, right, a little, little blocky chair. But sometimes the SA node will have a, a block. If the SA node cannot get impulses out into the atria, then the AV node will take over, sending impulses at about 60 beats per minute. 
And it'll actually, the AV node will send them both up into the atria and down into the ventricles. Right? It'll go kind of both ways because the SA node didn't, didn't depolarize the atria. That would be an SA node block. Much more commonly is something that we call an AV node block. That area at the right below the AV node is a quite narrow area. It's also an area that can tend to be damaged from um, atherosclerosis. And so it's a common area where blockage can occur in that, that AV node. So if we get blockage there, then the impulses could still be coming out of the SA node, stimulating the atria, but the impulses can't get through the AV node, so there's a block. So impulses are then going to originate down in the myocardial cells, and the impulses will cause the ventricles to contract at about 20 to 30 beats per minute. It's not going to be very efficient, right? So the atria are contracting pretty quickly. Ventricles only 20 to 30 beats per minute. If you took a person's pulse rate, what would we expect their pulse rate to be? Where does my pulse come from? The heartbeat, but, but where in the heart? Left ventricle, right? I'm feeling my left ventricle contract, so heartbeat would be 20 to 30 beats per minute. Right? Because that's where that we can feel the atrial contractions. Uh, so if that occurs, if a person has uh, some of these blockages, either SA or AV, again AV is much more common, 20 to 30 beats per minute is not going to be enough for that person to be up and walking around. So we will give them a pacemaker. Right? So a pacemaker can be inserted. I uh, didn't do a very good job of blowing this up. I could have made it bigger. But it's trying to show, well, one, you can see these pacemakers uh, with the advent of uh, microchips there and, and really nice lithium batteries. They're very efficient, very small. Uh, there's a quarter to give you the idea. Uh, and so typically, the uh, a flat skin is cut, and the, the pacemaker will be put underneath the skin. And then the electrodes will be run down uh, through the beta cavy into the right atrium and right ventricle. So they're trying to show electrodes running down in there into the right ventricle and, and right atrium. The early pacemakers were pretty crude. That is, they just sent them out, uh, put them at some pace, maybe 100 beats per minute, and their person's heart would always beat at 100 beats per minute. Not high enough for climbing stairs and too fast really for sleeping. The pacemakers now are much more efficient and, and much more sophisticated in that they're typically what we call demand pacemakers. So uh, the, the electrode that's up here near the atria can sense whether or not the SA node sends out an impulse. If it doesn't send out an impulse, then the pacemaker sends out an impulse. If it does send out an impulse, it doesn't have to. They also make these pacemakers so that they're sensitive to movement, so they put you don't need to know it, but it's called a little piezoelectric device in there, so that if the person starts walking fast or running, the jarring motion will stimulate the pacemaker to send out faster impulses so that they can keep up with whatever that is that they're, they're trying to do. The pacemakers can be adjusted externally uh, <coughs> by using a special electric device to adjust it right near when they put it near the pacemaker. They get sometimes concerned that pacemakers could be interfered with if there was leakage from microwave uh, ovens. And so sometimes you see the signs, right? Danger microwave oven in, in use. Not much of a risk anymore, but they still put the signs up. Um, whenever I talk about pacemakers, I'm sorry, I always go back to an old Saturday Night Live skit. Uh, Many, many, many years ago, Saturday Night Live, I still watch it. I think they have some pretty funny stuff on there. They don't really care about politically correct, mm -hmm. right? So this was years ago. That there used to be a commercial on TV uh, for Sears Die Hard batteries. Probably don't remember this commercial, but in the commercial, uh, they had like three or four cars set out in the snow. It's snowing. They're, all their lights are left on. One by one, the lights go out. Uh, and finally, one person walks out, got, gets in one of the cars, starts right up, drives off. Sears die hard. It'll never fail you, right? So, so Saturday Night Live had a bunch of guys dressed up like they were old men sitting on benches uh, on the stage. One by one, they all fell off their stools, but the one that had the Sears die hard battery got up and walked off the stage because his pacemaker. <laughs> you had to see it, right? So. All right, some uh, irregular rhythms, some dysrhythmias. Let's look at some dysrhythmias. So 
those of you that have a uh, lab, next Monday we're going to study ECGs. Next Wednesday, actually, we have another kind of an ECG lab. Uh, and when we look at irregular uh, rhythms, ECGs are helpful to help us diagnose what the rhythms are. We'll look at a couple of these abnormalities uh, in, in a second here. But um, it turns out that sometimes, besides having blocks in the conduction system, other abnormal rhythms develop. One of the abnormal rhythms that can develop is something called flutter. In flutter, the heart starts to beat at two to 400 beats per minute. 200 to 400 beats per minute. That's way too fast to be efficient. Typically, flutter will occur in either the atria or the ventricles. It doesn't necessarily uh, occur in both. It might, but not necessarily. One of the ways that we think that flutter develops is that we have something that we call circus movement. So here's the a crude drawing of the heart. And you wouldn't know this really from looking at cardiac uh, tissue or looking at the heart, but the, our cardiac muscle tissue is actually arranged in a swirl, both the ventricles and the atria, right? So it's arranged in a swirl. So when the two atria contract, it's actually more like a ringing motion. Same with the ventricles, kind of a ringing motion, like you're ringing out a sponge. And because the tissue is arranged in a swirl, when the SA node sends out its impulse and it travels around the atria, usually in a normal person, when it gets back to this area, the heart is in a refractory state, right? Because of that, that nice plateau, and so the impulse just ends. But what if the person's atria had enlarged? And typically it would be in the atria because valve disease occurs. We'll talk about the valves in a minute. But so what, what if all of a sudden, uh, not all of a sudden, but over time, the, the atria had gotten much larger? <clears throat> well, if that's the case, when the impulse originated in the SA node and traveled out and came all the way back, when it gets back to this place, that tissue may have repolarized. And now the impulse is just going to depolarize again. And so it's just going to start going around and around and around. They call it circus movement, like, right? Like in a circus, three ring circus. It just keeps going around and around and around, and it won't stop. So now the person's beat is two to 400 beats per minute. Could be in the atria, could be in the ventricles, could be both. Not very efficient beating because it's so fast. So we call this flutter. Another type of irregular rhythm, very serious, something that we call fibrillation. In fibrillation, the tissue is no longer coordinated, right? So in flutter, at least the tissue was still coordinated, right? It was going together. But in fibrillation, individual myocardial cells are all working at their own rate. Uh, and sometimes people describe this contraction that's on the heart that it looks like a bowl of worms because all of the tissue is doing its own thing. Well, now you have no pumping, right? Because the tissue is just all depolarizing at its own rate. You could have fibrillation of the atria. You could have fibrillation of the ventricles. You could have fibrillation of both. Fibrillation of the atria, relatively common. Uh, and it turns out people can actually be walking around and not even know that they have fibrillation of their atria. We'll find in a few minutes when we do cardiac output that the atria only add about 20% of the blood to the ventricles. So they'll be about 20% reduced in their ability to do work. Yes? I'm sorry, for flutter, why is it because the equation is bigger? Why does that make it the Because it takes so long for the impulse to travel all the way around the enlarged atria. By the time it gets back, there's been enough time for the tissue to repolarize. So in fibrillation, there's lots of things that can cause this, but you can think one way that this would happen is that, let's go back to our crude drawing of art here. So what if the impulse came around when it gets back to this area? This area was in a deep, a, um, already depolarized refractory state, but maybe the areas beside it had, had repolarized. The impulse could then split 
And now you'd have two different ring motions going, and then when they came around, maybe it would split again. And so pretty soon, all that tissue would be working at individual rates, right? Uh, so fibrillation of the atria, uh, about 20% reduction in your ability to do work. People can be up and walking around and not know that they have fibrillation of the atria. Fibrillation of the ventricles, whole different story, right? So if the ventricles are in fibrillation, the person has four to six minutes to live. Because if the ventricles are not contracting, no blood is being pumped, right? And no blood is being pumped to the brain, to the heart, to the lungs, right? So this is where it's an emergency. There's four to six minutes uh, before the person dies. To help a person that's in fibrillation, certainly uh, we want, would want to do cardiopulmonary resuscitation. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, but the real thing that they need is to have all of their heart tissue synchronized. So we give them a very strong electrical shock. We call this defibrillation. And typically, externally on the, on the chest, it would be somewhere between 2,000 to 4,000 volts. Those of you who have lab, think about the voltage that you were doing to the person's forearm. Some of you maybe got up to 40 to 50 volts, right? I just said 2,000 to 4,000 volts. So you watch your emergency room shows. You know what then when they, they kind of put the paddles on, they say clear, they give the person a shock, the person jumps off the table, right? So, uh, and then ideally, the heart starts to, everything's been depolarized the same. The next SA node impulse will come and re-coordinate. Many years ago when I was in sabbatical uh, up at uh, UC Davis Med Center in Sacramento, I was uh, able to watch actually a person get defibrillated. It was pretty exciting. Uh, I, at that time I was working with a cardiologist and one of the things that I was doing is I would go in and I'd watch people get angiograms. We'll talk about an angiogram a little bit later. Uh, but they would put a little bit of dye into the coronary arteries and watch to see how it flows. So I was watching a, an angiogram. I'd watch lots of other ones. Uh, and when the, uh, they were doing it, they always have a nurse that's watching the ECG. And the nurse uh, started to report that the person was having regular, irregular rhythms. Actually, we can learn to say if they were reporting that the person had premature ventricular contractions. Okay? A PVC, a premature ventricular contraction. If impulses originate in any place of the heart other than the SA node, we say the person has an ectopic focus. And that ectopic focus can result in a premature ventricular contraction. You've heard that term ectopic before, but you've heard it related to pregnancy. Ectopic means out of position, out of location, whether it's a pregnancy or in this case where the impulse is originating. Right? So if an, if an area begins to be sending out impulses that's not supposed to, we call this an ectopic focus. And it may result in the ventricles contracting too early, a premature ventricular contraction. Well, in this particular case, the person started having what they called runs of these PVCs, seven or eight in a row. And so the nurse said, I've seen runs of PVCs. And the doctor said, OK. So he started to pull the catheter out. They, they, were, they go up through the femoral artery, started to pull the catheter out. And all of a sudden, the person said, I've lost rhythm. All right, so now the person was in fibrillation. So they had the crash cart right there, and they said, OK, everybody clear, get the defibrillator. And so the nurse went, clicked the switch for the defibrillator. It didn't come on. Right? She says, I don't have any power. Right? And so she clicked it a couple more times. She said, we don't have any power. So then all hell broke loose, right? So I got up against the wall, right, out of the way, and they called a code, and people started running around other rooms trying to get another, another defibrillator, get the anesthesiologist uh, uh, in. Uh, the nurse kept trying the switch, and she kept throwing it through it, and eventually she said, I have power. It came on. So it was just a bad switch. Uh, they had power. 
They defibrillated the patient. He jumped about that far off the table. He came, the nurse said, I have regular rhythm again. Uh, and then he was there. Now, when they do these angiograms, the person's conscious, sedated. But uh, so the doctor said, Mr. Smith, are you okay? And Mr. Smith said, yeah, what happened? He said, well, we'll talk about it later. Just one shock, or is it and then, so it's one very strong shock, but if that doesn't restore the rhythm, they're going to continue to try again. At right. the same uh, voltage? At the same voltage. Mm -hmm. Yes? So do they sell these things at hospitals? Uh, they, they, now, so the, the, the type that's typically found in hospitals is not going to be found in Costco, but you all know, hopefully you know, that uh, they do sell now at Costco and other places the automated external defibrillators. We have two or three on this campus, uh, so you could buy one and have your own at home if you wanted one. Uh, they're in airports, anywhere where people tend to congregate, right? Where there's lots of people, and hopefully you've seen this somewhere, right? So if the person flops over and they don't have a heartbeat, yes, CPR is important, but what they really need is to have their heart defibrillated. These automated external defibrillators, can, you put it on the person's chest, it will talk to you and give you directions, and then it, if needed, will administer the shock that needs to be administered. Yes? you want to make sure there's no pacemaker? Yeah, if there's a pacemaker, well, the, hopefully the machine will, will tell you that. I don't know, I've never used one. It doesn't tell you. The machines tell you. They do. They do. Now they do. One would think, right? I mean, it should be hidden feet. The newer so models. Yeah, one would think that'll, that'll tell you. Okay. And Gary, is this for both atrial and and? Well, the atrial is not going to make you collapse, but uh, so if a person has atrial fibrillation, uh, the doctor usually discovers that, and the person could go in and they would do something called a cardio conversion, where they will give them a strong electrical shock uh, and try to get the atria to come back into regular rhythm. But the cardio conversion isn't the same as this. No, because the person with atrial fib is not going to kill over. But, but what? Still, still, it's a, a problem. And so, what is the cardio conversion? Yeah, so it's a strong electrical shock. Same thing. So, using the defibrillator only under a controlled condition. Okay. So, they're going to try to get those atria to recycle, to go back into rhythm. So, not that we need to know it, but here's a, a, a ECG trying to show flutter, so much faster than, than normal. And then here's ventricular fibrillation. <laughs> you know, we're not going to have to recognize these folks. Uh, but you can see there's no regular rhythm here. No regular pattern. It looks sawtooth, right? OK. So let's talk a little bit about electrocardiograms, ECGs, also called EKGs. Uh, clear back in the 1970s, the American Heart Association said, let's use the, the English C for an electrocardiogram instead of the K. With not much success, it's still, right, you go to clinics, it'll still say EKG instead of ECG. They're the same, right? ECG, EKG, same thing. The SA node is sending out those impulses at a regular pace. The impulse is spread over the heart. You get depolarization and repolarization. And we can record this electrical activity on the surface of the body. In a sense, you're all just giant sacks of salt water. Right? So now you can go home and say, my instructor insulted me today. He said I was a giant sack of salt water. Uh, but right, we got fluid everywhere. Salts are in there. And so every time the heart depolarizes, not only does the impulse travel to the heart, it travels all through the body. And if we put sensors on the surface of the body, we can record these changes that are occurring, electrocardiogram. It's a great tool because it's non-invasive, right? You put something on the surface, you haven't hurt the person, and it gives us quite a bit of information to help us diagnose if the heart is contracting the way that it's supposed to be contracted. Uh, really, we're not seeing contractions, we're seeing depolarization, but it still gives us the, the idea what's going on. Uh, turns out that when we put sensors on the body, depending upon where you put them, you'll get different readings. And so we have what we call 12 
universal leads. Okay? 12 universal leads, 12 different ways to put these on the surface of the body. We have three bipolar limb leads. We have three what we call unipolar leads, sometimes called the augmented vector. And we have six chest leads. Now we're not going to learn these different leads here in lecture, but those of you that have lab are going to have a chance to learn the 12 different ways of, of hooking the body up, right? These, these 12 different leads. When we put the sensors on the body, we're going to get a recording. And, and the typical recording that you're going to see is something that we call a lead two. And it's because it tends to be nice, big waves. And so here would be a typical lead two recording, right? showing it P, Q, R, S, and T. Here we have it, right, in a diagram way. So the first wave that we see is something that we call the P wave. Then we have this, what we call a QRS complex, but a Q wave that's down, R, S. And again, it depends on which uh, lead we're using, but this is a, a standard lead too. And then we see this T wave. And if you look up here, you have to look closely, but there's the P, there's the Q, R, little S, there's the T. Over and over and over again. Each wave represents something that's occurring electrically in the heart. The P wave represents depolarization of the atrium. So the P wave is depolarization of the atrium. The QRS complex represents depolarization of the ventricles. The T wave represents repolarization of the ventricles. What's missing? Repolarization of the atria, right? So we have depolarization of the atria, repolar or depolarization of the ventricles, repolarization of the ventricles, but no repolarization of the atria. It turns out that repolarization of the atria occurs during the QRS complex. We can't see it. Okay? So we can't see it, but it occurs during that time. So by looking at this ECG, we can see if the tissue is depolarizing and repolarizing normally. We look at amplitudes. Right, so the heights of the waves. We also look at the durations of the waves, how long things take, right, the time period. And by looking at those, we can again get an idea if there's normal uh, <coughs> polarization and repolarization. I'm going to give you a couple of abnormalities to help us understand how this can be used. We're not going to spend a bunch of time on abnormalities. Here, just by the way, here's the trying to show where the chest leads are placed. And then we can laugh and go through that. So one of the abnormalities is something that we call first degree AV block. Okay? First degree AV block. We talked about AV block already. We're talking about the AV node B block. And in first degree AV block, the time delay from the that the atria first depolarized, start to depolarize, the start of the P wave, until the start of the QRS complex is lengthened. Okay, so in first degree block, the impulse is taking longer to travel through that AV node than it normally would. It's still getting through, but it's taking a long time. And we can tell that it's first degree AV block because, right? We know that the start of the impulse is in the SA node. It spreads over the atria to do the, the P wave. And then when it starts down in through that AV node, right, comes through the AV node, we're going to start to get the QRS complex as we start to get depolarization of the ventricles. So any lengthening of the time in here would indicate that the person has a delay. So we're going to call that first degree AV block. In second degree AV block, some of the impulses don't make it through. 
So you already could have this lengthening of the, uh, this, this time, and actually we should name that time. So the time period from the start of the P to the start of the QRS complex is called the PR interval. <coughs> And I know they should have called it the PQ interval, but sometimes the Q wave doesn't show up, and so they called it the PR interval. So a lengthening of that PR interval would be first degree AV block. That happened here. Okay. In second degree AV block, we can have a lengthening of the, a, the uh, PR interval. Look at that long, right? So here would be like normal. Here's a really long PR interval here. But in second degree AV block, some of the impulses are dropped. That is, the AV node doesn't let the impulse come through into the ventricles. So look what happened. There's P, Q, R, S, T. P, Q, R, S, T. P, Q, R, S, T. P, uh oh. No impulse down into the ventricles, no beat. All right? So we have a droppage of the impulse. So in second degree block, some of the impulses don't get through them. In third degree AV block, I don't have a, a diagram here, but in third degree AV block, there is no coordination between the atria and the ventricles. So it's third degree AV block is complete blockage of the AV node. No impulses come through. And so you're gonna have P waves occurring randomly, QRS complexes occurring randomly. They're not coming through. Okay, third degree block. Another abnormality that I'd like to mention is an elevated ST segment. An elevated ST segment. So we expect the, the wave, or really the, the time, from the end of the S to the start of the T to be flat. That is to be even with the time interval that was right here before the QRS complex. So we expect it to be even. But if you look in here, you can see, it's, it's not great, but you can start to see that this <coughs> it has severely elevated this area between the QRS complex and the T. And the, and the T. It's <coughs> elevated there. And elevation of the ST segment may indicate that the person is having a myocardial infarction, a heart attack. Huh? It may indicate a myocardial infarction. If the ST segment was depressed, so if this area was, instead of being raised up, was depressed, was lower, it can indicate that the person has myocardial ischemia. We know what that word means. Ischemia means low blood flow, all right? So myocardial ischemia would mean they're having low blood flow to the heart muscle. So <coughs> they have partial blockage of their coronary arteries. We're gonna do, talk about atherosclerosis a little bit later. Okay, so elevated ST segment might indicate they're having a heart attack. Depressed ST segment can indicate ischemia. So, you know, the, the person's experiencing chest pain, you run them off to the hospital, what's the very first thing they're gonna do? They're gonna slap an ECG on them and take a look because they're looking to see are there changes in the electrocardiogram, particularly they'd like to look at that ST segment area and if there's elevation or depression. Uh, so it's passive, you haven't heard the patient, but you can get some rapid information as to the health of the heart. Okay, and there's lots and lots of little abnormalities. Uh, we're not gonna go learn them. Um, you go on if you decide to uh, go into uh, nursing or, or medicine. Uh, they are gonna train you in recognizing abnormalities, right? They'll put you through special training. Heart valves and sounds. Okay, let's talk about heart valves and, and sounds. So you know that there are valves between the atria and the ventricles, right? There are valves between the atria and the ventricles. Did I get this in the right place for your handout? Is it before the, is it the next one or did I? Oh, there's cycles. Yeah. Well, uh, some of you have older copies of the, um, the 
PowerPoint. Some of you have this now, right? Some of you don't. So I'd like to talk about vowels first. We'll get to the cycle later. So you know that these vowels uh, are there to ensure one-way flow of the blood. Between the two atria and the two ventricles, there are the atrioventricular valves, the tricuspid and the bicuspid. Between the ventricles and the aorta and the pulmonary trunk, there's the semilunar valves. So these valves work passively to prevent backflow. So when the atria contract, those valves, we want them to have them open. So if pressure is greater than, from above than below, the valves simply kind of fall down and we let blood flow into the ventricles. When the ventricles contract, the pressure builds up from below and it causes those AV valves to fill kind of like parachutes. And we got those cordy tendony. So kind of picture them as parachutes. They fill and they actually snap together and they stop blood from going back into the atria. When the pressure continues to build in the ventricles, it's going to push up into the aorta and the pulmonary artery, depending on which side we're in, and those little valves, those semilunar valves, are little cups. As pressure's greater from below, they fold up against the wall of the vessel, and they allow blood to flow out into, let's say, the aorta. When the ventricle starts to go into diastole, that is to rest, the blood's gonna try to come back from the aorta, and those little cups close, there's three of them, and they're gonna snap shut, and they're gonna make a sound. And if you listen to those sounds with a stethoscope, you can hear them closing. As the AV valves close, you'll hear the sound that we call lup. It's really the snapping shut of the AV valves. Yeah. You'll hear lup. When the semilunar valves close, they make kind of a dup sound. And so the sounds that we expect to hear over and over again are lup dup, lup dup. Loved it. Those of you who have a lab today uh, have a chance to, to listen to those sounds. Sometimes damage occurs to those valves and they may not open all the way or they may not close all the way. If they fail to open all the way, we say the person has stenosis. The valve has stenosis. Okay? So failure to open all the way. Stenosis. A failure to close all the way we call regurgitation. So, right, regurgitation maybe you learned means vomiting, right? And so if your mitral valve <laughs> does not close all the way, the blood regurgitates back into the left atrium. Okay? When we hear these abnormal sounds, we call these murmurs. To listen to a sound in the body, it doesn't have to be a heart sound, to listen to any sound in the body, we call that auscultation. So you can auscultate the colon, you can auscultate the lungs, but if you're auscultating the heart, you will hear the heart sounds and you may hear a murmur. Okay? You may hear a murmur. So instead of the normal lubbed up sounds, regurgitation or stenosis makes abnormal sounds. So you might hear something like lubbed up shh, lubbed up shh, or you might hear lub clicked up, lub clicked up. You'll hear different sounds. Years ago, I actually had a tape uh, that I bought on abnormal heart sounds, right? The murmurs. Uh, you know, cardiologists have amazing hearing and amazing ability to do these things. I, I listened and listened and listened. It's really, really hard to pick up which sound is causing which type of, of murmur, right? Because you have regurgitation, you have stenosis, and then you have the two different sets of valves. So uh, at any rate, uh, it gave me a real appreciation for cardiologists, right, that they can listen to these different sounds. Uh, many of us have murmurs. I have a murmur. Hasn't affected me in my life. Very mild, right? So some of you have mild murmurs. If the murmur is severe, so that if the valve is severely stenosed or regurgitating, the valve will need to be replaced. Uh, and uh, the original valve replacements that they did, the original valves that, that they used were really pretty crude mechanical valves uh, that looked like, like this one. Uh, so they were really kind of a, uh, ball and basket 
kind of arrangement, like a, a snorkel. So sometimes they have a little ping pong ball and a snorkel, right, to stop backflow. They used to anyway, they don't do it much anymore. Uh, and so the idea was, right, if pressure comes from above, it caused the ball to fall down against the cage. When pressure came from below, the ball would come up and, and close that off. It worked, okay, but you tend to damage lots of blood cells in the process, right, because that ball tended to squeeze the, the cells. Uh, mechanical valves nowadays tend to be more kind of a, a, a flap arrangement, kind of like a flap in, the, in your uh, toilet. Uh, but very commonly, uh, animal valves are used, particularly pig valves. Uh, so there are actually uh, specially raised pigs that are used because their hearts are the same size as human hearts. They kill the pig. They, I know it's horrible. Right? Uh, they kill the pig. They harvest the valve. They treat the valve so that it does no, no longer will stimulate the immune system. And they take the valve, they sew it into a plastic ring, and then they sew that into the, the place where the, the valve needs to be replaced. In the past, that's always had to be done through open heart surgery. So they had to crack the chest, uh, open the heart. They had to put the person on a heart-lung machine. Uh, nowadays, still just kind of coming out, but uh, they, they do have available now uh, for many people, the ability to replace these valves actually using a catheter. So they run the catheter up into the heart uh, and then they simply inflate the valve in its location uh, so that they don't have to stop the heart, open the chest. Kyle? Do they also remove the power and muscles in the body with it? Uh, yeah, they'll remove those because they're going to take it out and hold out. They don't, pathway muscles aren't going to work anymore, right? So uh, actually, they're going to read. I think they, you know, I, I should check on that. But I believe they, it's all, the papillary muscles are there. I believe all of the artificial cordy tendony are, are strings, that they don't try to reuse those. All right. Cardiac cycle. Question? So, uh, doesn't the cardiac cycle sound like something you work out on at the gym? Yeah, I get on the cardiac cycle. I work out about 30 minutes every day. No. What we want to do here with the cardiac cycle is to talk about the changes that are occurring in the heart each time the heart goes through contraction and relaxation. Before we start into this, I, I don't want you to get yourself so buried in the detail that you forget that you already know what's occurring here. So let's look again, think about what's occurring, and then we're going to look at the details. So 